I will take my text today from Acts chapter 2 and verse 40. Acts chapter 2 and verse 40. I will title the sermon today, Two Words Said Three Ways. Two words said three ways. There used to be a time, in fact, not too awful long ago, where we as ministers could address specifically the spiritual side of things and leave the ethical and moral side pretty much alone. And the reason that we could do that and not come out directly and address everything as moral and everything as ethical, we could address it all through the spiritual uh, rim, is because there was a strong sense of what was ethical and what was not, and there was a strong sense of what was moral and what was not. But I am finding out that that period is long gone which then leaves upon us, the pastors and the ministers, a burden of not only teaching you spiritual things, but teaching you moral and ethical things as well. And while maybe a congregation of this age average still has a strong sense of the ethical and the moral, the younger generation that comes up among us may not. And so, if what I say today seems to be common sense to you, I understand that. But I would pray that you also would understand that I am trying my best to make sure that everyone in this room understands what is ethical and what is moral and how it ties in with the spiritual. Because the moral and the ethical does have a direct connection to the spiritual. And the older I get, the more easily I can see cause and effect. At first, I thought it was just maturity that done that for you. I thought that everybody who grew up and aged matured, and maturity helped you make the connection between cause and effect. And to some degree, I believe that is true. But I have found that that is not the case with everyone. In fact, people who have not been taught the ethical and the moral is having problems making a connection between cause and effect. And so I want to use this message today to address that issue and with that background in mind. If you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 2 and verse 40, I want you to notice the text. I'll let you remain seated since I've already started preaching. And with many other words did he, that is Peter, testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Three word, two words said three ways. Save yourselves. Let us pray. Father, I want to say thank you for your grace today and thank you for your mercy. You have indeed been good to us. Give me an ability to communicate clearly, to communicate precisely and accurately with your people today. Let the words be yours, not mine. I ask it in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Our text comes from the sermon preached by St. Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The congregation that day was made up of all sorts of people. Some were sincere and yet confused. Others were self-righteous and closed-minded. Many were outright skeptics and made a mockery of what they did not understand. And yet to that generation, Peter uttered the words of our text on that momentous day and 3,000 people heard and heeded and responded to the apostles' message. And here was the highlight of that message. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Untoward is not a common word that we use every day, so let us spend a moment confirming its meaning. The word untoward is an English word substituted for a Greek word which means crooked, harsh, 
unjust, dishonest, immoral, evasive, curved, bent, twisted, tangled, and unscrupulous. That's what the Greek word for untoward meant. And Peter uses that Greek word in this passage to describe the generation of people in the first century that he was speaking to. But if you evaluate the words which makes up the definition of untoward, I believe you will see that that word untoward still describes the generation of today. We lived in a bent, crooked, harsh, twisted, tangled, unscrupulous, you name it, generation. We live in an untoward generation. So what does Peter mean when he says, save yourselves from this untoward generation? If, if we fail to carefully consider Peter's words, we will simply reject them and cast them aside as an impossibility. Because after all, who can save themselves, right? Isn't it true that only God can save a soul? Perhaps you would, you would cite Ephesians 2 and 8. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Well, now, we seem to have a problem, don't we? What in the world are we to do with this passage? We have two scriptures that seem to contradict one another. Acts 2.40 tells us to save ourselves, and Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 says we cannot. So what are we to do with this exhortation? Friends, when we encounter such an issue in Scripture, we must stop ourselves and say like Moses did at the burning bush, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. There's some things in Scripture that is pretty straightforward, and then there's some things that causes you to stop, to take time, to dig into it, to figure out what it really means. Sadly, though, our instincts in today's world are not like those of Moses. We are not too curious when it comes to understanding what the Word of God means. We would just rather toss it aside and say it's a contradiction and think no more of it. Satan says you can't understand it, so don't worry about it. But I want to submit to you that moments like these are our burning bush moments. What are we to think or what are we to do when Scripture seems to contradict itself? Well, first of all, we must humble ourselves and realize that Scripture never contradicts itself. If there seems to be a contradiction, it's because we do not understand something essential to the meaning of each passage. I think we tend to leave this particular discrepancy along because we rather like the idea that salvation requires nothing of us, that God does it all for us, and therefore we have no part to play, and salvation requires nothing of us. That, however, is an oversimplification of the doctrine of salvation by grace, a teaching that has been distorted to emphasize God's role in salvation at the peril of allowing man to think that we may do as we please and God will save us despite it. So how do we solve this illusion of Scripture contradicting itself in these two passages? Well, first look at, let's look at the meaning of the word save. If you look at the word save in Acts chapter 2 and 40, you'll find that the meaning of the word saved is the same as it is in Ephesians chapter 2 and 8. And what we find is that they are of the same Greek root meaning the same thing. In both passages, the word saved means to save or to deliver. So clearly that does not resolve our situation. However, a bit of common logic will resolve this conundrum. It will unlock our understanding if we will use it. We all know from human experiences that we do not have the power that we do have the power to save ourselves from certain situations. While we cannot forgive our sins and expunge our souls of the black stains of iniquity, we do work other little salvations on our own behalf quite often. For instance, you may stumble 
and reach out and take hold of something stable, thereby saving yourself from falling. You just saved yourself. You could obey traffic laws and save yourself from a fine or an accident or bodily injury. You may save yourself from financial ruin by making wise and sound choices in the management of your finances. You see, everything in Scripture does not have to be seen purely through a spiritual, doctrinal, theological lens. It is quite clear that while we cannot save our souls, we may and often do save ourselves from many forms of suffering, heartbreak, and tragedy. Now with that established, the fact that we do and can save ourselves in many ways, we will exclude the one way for this purpose this morning, which we cannot be our own Savior. And consider the text in the light of the fact that we can and many times do save ourselves by knowledge, obedience, and conduct. For this remainder of the message, I want you to block out the whole thing about washing away sins and being cleansed because it does not apply to this particular genre of thought. I'm talking about Choices that we can make that will cause our lives to be more like Christ and become, be more happy and productive and things that will cause us to stand out from everybody else. Choices that will keep us from suffering the same negative effects that the world at large is suffering because they made the bad choices. How many of you know that you make a choice and you suffer the consequences of that choice? And if you make the same choices that everybody else in the world is making, you're going to wind up just like everybody else in the world. And so in that instance, Peter looks across at his generation and he says, this world is bent, this world is curved, this world is twisted, this world is tangled, this world is not a good world, things are going rogue and haywire, and he says to them, save yourself. Don't be like everybody else. Don't go along with the crowd. You've got something to say in the matter. Make a change. Save yourself. So first of all, the two words, save yourselves, is said as a command. The apostle points to a harsh, crooked, unjust, immoral, twisted world, and he says to his listeners, save yourselves. If you do not put some effort into your life, if you do not make changes in your thoughts, behaviors, and priorities, you are going to end up just like everyone else. If you do not pay attention to your lifestyle, if you continue to live like the people around you, you will end up no better than they are. But Peter says, you know how to preserve the world. You may not recognize it, but you hold a key to solving the crises in this world. If I was preaching to leaders today, I would take a totally maybe different approach. But I'm not. I'm preaching to lay people today who have really very little power seemingly on the world stage. We can't solve all the international and national crises. It's not our prerogative to do so. We don't have the authority for it. But we can solve the dilemmas of our own lives in many ways. And by solving the own dilemmas in our lives, we can also make the world around us a better place. A place that is more productive and more positive and more holy than those of the normal persons in this world. We easily like to sit back and say, I can't do anything about it. We call for a bowl of, of metaphorical water, and we like Pilate, wash our hands. I can't do anything about the drug crisis. I can't do anything about the violence. I can't do anything about the immorality. I have no power. But you do have power to at least save yourself. You are not a victim. You do not have, it's not that you don't have a say in this. It's not that you can't make your own choices. It's not that you can't do something. And it's time that we hear the words of the Apostle Peter when he looks out straight across the audience and he says, save yourselves. We know how messed up the world is, how deceived people are. 
And we like to talk about the messed up world. We like to pray about the messed up world. We like to pray about the moral and spiritual disaster around us. But somehow we still think that we can be, live, think, talk, and believe like everybody else. And somehow we are going to wind up in a different positive way than they have. This is the fallacy that every person who ever struggles with anything first is met with. The drunkard has it. The drug addict has it. The the fornicator has it. I can do this and it won't affect me like it did everybody else. I can manage this better than they did. I'm more powerful than they are. I have better self-control than they do. I know how to wiggle it around and work it around and manipulate the thing so that it comes out in my favor. My friend, if we do the same things that everyone else does, we will wind up like everybody else. We are human and sin and bad choices has a universal effect on humanity and thousands before us has shown us what those effects are and the current generation is showing us what those effects are. We need to wake up and realize we have to change we have to be different we have to think different we have to live different we have to act and react different if we don't want to be a part of the mint bent up curved twisted mangled world that is around us the apostle says in no uncertain words if you think that you can live like everybody else and do everything everybody else is doing and wind up different he says think again Doing, saying, thinking, practicing, believing the same things everybody else does is going to result in you being just like everyone else. God will forgive you of your sins, but he is not going to change your thoughts. He is not going to change your beliefs. He is not going to change your practices without your assistance. You are going to have to put forth an effort to save yourself. Paul expresses the same thought in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and 17 where he writes, Wherefore come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Here's another facet, or facet, however you want to say it. The South rules our awe, doesn't it? I put a U in it, faucet, it's meant facet. There's another facet to this, this thought And that is that in order to change and not be like everybody else, you have to put distance between you and everybody else. Oh, come on, somebody. You know, the saying is, if you lay down with the dogs, you'll get up with fleas. I had a friend one time that changed that. I think I've shared this with you, but I like it. It said, if you lay down with the dogs, you'll get up with puppies. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, whether it's fleas or puppies, you hang around with the wrong crowd and you're going to catch whatever they're carrying. You're going to begin to act and to think like them. You're going to be able to talk. You're going to begin to talk like them. You're going to be able to react and believe like them. It's important that you pay attention to your surroundings and it's important that you choose your surroundings. I know you have to work with heathens. I know you have to go to school with heathens. I know we rub up against them in the supermarket. But my friend, when it comes time to to picking what we can to spending our spare time and our leisure time, we can choose who we spend our time with and we can choose where we spend our time and how we spend our time. And if we're going to save ourselves, we've got to start making good choices. God's not going to do everything for us. We have to put effort into this. We cry, God, do it all. While we live carelessly and we even pray, God, save me, deliver me. And God's response to us in in many matters is save yourselves. You know right from wrong. Do what is right. You have my word. Read it. Study it. Save yourselves from illiteracy concerning the scriptures. You know that I, the Lord, should be your number one priority. Put me in that top spot and move everything down to a lower level. Save yourselves. 
In Luke chapter 13, Jesus is teaching a crowd, and while he's teaching them, he brought up two recent tragedies that had grabbed the national attention. And Jesus referenced those tragedies, and he asked his listeners this question. Do you think that the people who lost their lives and were injured in that tragedy is worse than you? Do you think they suffered the tragedy, the death, because they were so much different than you? And he answered by saying, absolutely not. I tell you, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. The word repent in verse 5 means to have a change of self in the heart and the mind. It means to abandon former dispositions and that results in a new self, a new behavior, and regret over the former behavior and dispositions. Simply put, that word repent means to change one's ways. The command is do things differently. Quit following the crowd. Stop living, thinking, and reacting the same old way all the while hoping for different results. Stop even waiting on divine intervention when the power is in your hand to save yourself. He first says the two words as a command, save yourself. Secondly, he says it as a plea, save yourselves. Peter looks over his audience with compassion akin to that of the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36 where it is written that Jesus saw the multitudes and he was moved with compassion because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And Peter looks upon his audience, all of them so broken and afflicted by the sin and the oppression of the world going off the rails and he sees them being swept toward the cataract of moral dissolution and issues these words as a plea, save yourselves. Do not take the path of least resistance. Don't deceive yourself that everything will work out at last. Don't count on something or someone to save you despite your apathy and lethargy. Develop some courage. Take a stand. Reach for God. Reach for righteousness. Apply the standard of God to your lives and your thoughts. This world, he says, is not getting better. People as a whole are sinking into dissolution and damnation. And if you do not do something different than the masses who are around you, you will perish with them. Oh, save yourselves. God can throw you a rope, but he can't make you grab it. You have to make the choice. To save yourself. I know it's not easy. I'm not preaching this glibly. I'm not trying to tell you to just, oh, flip a switch and things. No, I know it's work. I know it's a process. I know it's hard. I know you stumble. I know you'll fall because I know that because I do it myself. But you have to make an effort to save yourself. And it can't be just one day or one moment or one hour or one instance. You have to say, this is going to be a new way of life for me. I'm not going to walk in the oldness of life. I'm going to walk in the newness of life. I'm going to save myself from some of this stuff that keeps tripping me up and causing me pain and heartbreak and keeps leading me on to destruction. I'm going to turn around. I'm going to go a different direction. I don't care if you don't agree with me. I can't help it if you think I'm weird. I don't know what to tell you. I may be strange, but I know that if I don't make a change, I'm going to end up like everybody else, and I'm not okay with that. We hear, we hear the echoes of a brokenhearted Jesus when he weeps over Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37. Notice what he says. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you killed the prophets. You stoned them which I sent to you. How often would I have gathered you together like a hen gathers her chickens under her wings? And you would not. That was not a curse. That was a lament. It was a plea. Jesus was saying to Jerusalem, you could have saved yourself, but you didn't. 
You lived like the heathen. You thought and worshipped like the heathen. And now you're doomed to, uh, to a destruction at the hands of the heathen. There was a space where you could have saved yourself. I don't want anybody in this room today to come to a place where it's too late. I don't want anybody in this room to hit a bottom so hard and so harsh that you are literally broken and almost beyond repair. I know that with God all things are possible. But hey, let me tell you, God wants to break the fall a long time before you hit the bottom. Let me plead with you like Peter did. Save yourself. Start mending the marriage before it winds up in divorce court. Start rejecting the addiction before it takes precedent over everything. Stop allowing the bitterness and the immorality to fester in you and to cause you to make outward gross immoral actions of sin. Save yourself. You're not going too far. You can still do something about it. But the more power you give to the things that is leading you down the wrong path, the more power they will have. And there will come a point when you cannot quit and you cannot lay it down and you cannot change it. The past, the past has, has taken wings and flew away and you're left in a shattered present with nobody and no one to help you. And you can't help yourself. Oh, save yourself. Thirdly, save yourselves is said as an exhortation. Peter plays the role of an exhorter here, an encourager, and he says to his listeners, you can do this. It's not too late. You don't have to be like everyone else. You don't have to suffer the same fate as everyone else. You have another choice. Save yourself. Make up your mind. I'm going to do this for me. I'm not doing this for a loved one. I'm not doing this for the preacher. I'm not doing this for society. I'm doing this for me. I can control my own world to a degree and I'm going to control it with everything I have and I'm going to invite God to take a hold of the things I can't control but I'm going to make an effort and when God sees you wanting to make an effort he'll come to your aid and he'll help you he'll never take it all and do it for you but he'll give you strength to change things one step at a time one act at a time one thought at a time one choice at a time you can do this save yourself Don't wait on an intervention. Don't be afraid to stand alone. I think saving yourself starts right up here. I told you this was a practical message more than a spiritual one. It's got spiritual implications, and you can tie them together if you will. But I think sometimes we go straightly after the spiritual, and we forget there's a practical side to this whole thing. And if you do that, you're setting yourself up for failure. It starts right here. It's getting your mind right. It's renewing your mind. The Bible talks about renew your mind. It simply means get the old stuff out, put something new in it, And I suggest you put something religious, God's Word, in it. Something that will stand the test of time. Don't go after some... 12-step program. I'm not against them, but friends, you've got to have Jesus somewhere up in here. You've got to have God to help you make some choices. God to help you understand how things connect together. God to help you in the hard times, to help you stand firm when everything within you wants to bow down and buckle. God to help you and give you a push in the firm in the right way when everything within you wants to take a hard left turn. You've got to have God on this platform with you. You've got to have God involved you have to have help from the divine but the power is largely in your hands God's not going to change you unless you want to change 
He's not going to save you unless you want to be saved. Don't be afraid to stand alone. You've got to get it in your mind that what other people think about you is just their opinion. It don't control your world. It don't make you greater or lesser than you are. It's just their opinion. And you've got to receive it and file it as such. You know in your own heart, if you will stop and listen, you know in your own heart when things are not right and when it is leading you in the wrong direction. And if you can't make the heart connection, if you could just open your eyes and look around you, it don't take a whole lot of discernment to, to discern when things are getting worse or when they're getting better. And if you'll just go back and re-examine your life and say, okay, what was I doing? What did I start doing or what did I stop doing when things started going down the hill? You'll have a revelation. The prodigal son started out by remembering how it used to be. I used to be in the father's house. I used to have plenty to eat. I used to have decent clothes to wear. I used to feel like the father loved me and cared for me. But now I'm in this hog pen. Now I don't have sufficient clothing. I'm not eating anything but slop. It's a really bad, crooked, twisted, untoward world that I'm living in. How did it get this way? And then he remembered. It started when I left the father's house. When I got all full of myself and I popped my cocky attitude and I told daddy to give me what was mine. It all started going downhill right there. So then logic took over. How do you change it? Well, I don't know for sure. But I think the first step would be to get out of where I am and to go back and make things right with daddy. Oh, come on, somebody. This ain't rocket science. This is pretty simple stuff here. We have to bust ourselves out of our delusion and our illusion. And we have to realize that when things are going wrong for us, more than likely there's a reason behind it. And we need to find out what that reason is. And we need to find out what the motivation that caused it to make the choices was. And when we link those two up, we have an idea of how to start unraveling it. you got to take lessons from some of the Bible characters like Noah. He built an ark, and it had never rained. Boy, those people had a field day. You know they did. They were people. They had a field day. He just kept on hammering. He kept on doing what he knew he had to do. We need to take a lesson from the three Hebrew children. They was in a crowd and everybody else was doing one thing. And they said, I don't want to wind up like everybody else. So I guess I need to do something different. When they bow, I think I'll just stand. You say, well, that landed them in the fiery furnace. Not for long. Not for long. They came out of it. Will there be consequences? Will people persecute you? Yes, 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 yes. But it doesn't matter. They are not the ones that is going to have to suffer your pain and have to go through your heartbreak and have to go through your tragedies. You have to make an effort to change yourself and to avoid the disasters and the pitfalls that you're headed straight toward. No matter how good of friends they are, they cannot take your pain. No matter how loyal they are, they cannot mitigate mitigate the results of your bad decisions. They They can encourage you to make them, but they cannot help you with it afterwards. you got to take a lesson from the prophets. Church, they stood still and said, Thus saith the Lord, despite everybody in the world against them. Save yourselves. 
The Bible talks about this in an interesting light. And I want to tie this back in as I conclude to the first part of the sermon where I talked about we seem to have little power in our world, and we do. But we do have power. And I will be talking about this more as we get closer to next year's election cycle. And in light of the coming up cycle, I think it's appropriate as well. We don't have a lot of power over who gets into political office and who doesn't. But we do have some power. It's called a ballot box. And it's called prayer. And we can sit here and wring our hands over the idiots that might take office after the election. But if we don't vote and we don't pray, we're not trying to help ourselves. Well, hello. And you say, well, who in the world would be that stupid? Let me tell you, there are Christians out there that have shut down on the whole system. And they say, it's all a farce and it's all rigged and I'm not going to mess with it anymore. And yet they gripe and complain because the vilest men and women are exalted, but they will not try to save themselves. Well, it's been good talking to you. Here's what the Bible says in Ezekiel. Ezekiel is talking to a generation. He is prophesying to a generation like that of ours and that of Peter's. And here's what he says. Though these three men were in this generation, Noah, Daniel, and Job, three of the godliest men that you can find, he said, if they were standing in this generation, they would only be able to deliver their own soul. You see, the Bible understands that our power is limited. But it does not do away with the fact that we can save ourselves and we should. Let me use an argument my parents used on me, and I don't think it's a great argument, but it's logical. If everybody's going to hell, do you want to go too? If everybody else is going to prison, do you want to go too? If everybody else is living a life that is miserable and messed up, do you want to do that too? If you do, do what they're doing. Follow them. But if you want something different, make a change. And when you make a change, your change not only affects you, but it affects your circle around you. I may start preaching a a line of this ethical, and if I do, it's going to get a lot more personal than this. I've kind of just scattered load today, but let me tell you as an as a example. Everybody knows that our, our world is getting more violent. But nobody, nobody wants to make a change to the things they watch and support with their money and the games they play online. Not even Christians. You let your kids sit there and play with those violent video games and then you're shocked out of your wits because they're violent. That's on you. Make a change. Well, you can say that. You don't have no kids. You don't know how, how they get on your nerves. Yeah, that's why I didn't have any. But you did. You took that commitment. You made yourself that responsibility. And if you don't extra, exor, um, if you don't do it like you should do it, you're going to contribute to another generation that don't know how to make a change in their kids. And the world's going to become more violent and more violent and more violent. It's time for somebody to save themselves. I can talk about debt. I can talk about gluttony. I can talk about addiction. I can talk about church issues. And I will. Everybody wants churches to do better than they're doing. Everybody wants it to be a force to be reckoned with. Everybody wants it to thrive. But nobody wants to make a change in their attendance habits. 
Nobody wants to pray more. Nobody wants to seek God more. Nobody wants to make it a tight priority. We want it to change, but we will not save ourselves. Peter says, save yourself. Your first responsibility is to yourself. To save yourself. Then he pleads with you, save yourselves. It don't have to end like it does for everybody else. The church don't have to be empty like everybody else's church. It don't have to dry up and be uninfluential. Save yourself. Your kids don't have to grow up to be violent. Save yourself. They don't have to grow up to be disrespectful. I didn't get in this because it was fun. Save yourself. And then he closes with an exhortation. You can do it. You don't have to think this world is too far gone. The generation below, the, the, the current generation is a total loss and we can't do nothing with them and we can't do anything. We can't retroact this stuff and we can't get a handle on this stuff. It's all going, no, no. With God, all things are possible. We either believe that or we don't. We may not see the change we want to see in our generation, but if we will start trying to save ourselves and the generation that is following us, they'll see a difference, and their children will see a difference. And God help us if we're not concerned about that.